Okay. Well, thank you all for um, staying with us for the second part of our program, which should be a really interesting aspect of the afternoon. We have a panel, and the panel is going to talk amongst itself a little bit, but really the idea is to establish interconnection with your group, and so we do hope that the conversation is going to extend way off the podium and into the group in terms of uh, either questions and answers or observations and things that folks want to talk about. I uh, have a um, uh, unfortunate announcement that uh, Haley Safers, who we really hoped would be able to join us here, uh, is ill today and has sent her regrets. Uh, she's a scientist working on uh, Mars and working in the Arctic and also is uh, very passionate about the arts as well. Uh, she's not able to join us and sends her regrets. But we have with us the rest of the panel, Nita, of course, who was introduced earlier, Jo Ong, who is an associate professor at York University, and an artist as well as part of the work that he does at the intersection between social justice, art, humanity, and the Anthropocene. I think you call it Art at the End of the World. <laughs> it's a rather fearsome title, but I'll let you explain more about that. And Charles Stanovich, who is in also an associate professor, but in this case at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Architecture and Landscape and Design. And we met because Charles is also inspired by many things, but some of them science-driven, uh, approached me about an art um, installation and exhibit that he was doing. Uh, for which I'm, I'm still fascinated to see how that all works out. <laughs> so what I thought I'd do is open the panel up by allowing you guys to give some introduction about your thoughts on this, the space that you occupy in within this kind of interface, what it is that you do, what you enjoy doing, and how that has brought you to this um, aspect of things around the origin of life or the beginning of uh, or life's interaction with the planet. And so with that sort of hand waving introduction. I will hand it over to the experts, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments and then our conversation. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I, I wanted to like openly thank you. Um, you. You mentioned it already, but you were an amazing um, uh, conversationalist in the project, and I thought I would actually maybe talk about the project that you were such a great help on. Um, and there are other people here that were here today as well, from the ROM, Veronica, and Tim Tate, and so forth, uh, the meteorite specialists over there. Um, which were really kind of amazing um, conversationalists. I just want to publicly thank everyone because um, they really made the project uh, have some depth and was very inspirational, just like the conversation today was. So I'm, I'm like learning so much. Um, maybe we can throw up the first slide um, of the project I'm talking about that Barbara was so helpful on. Um, it's called The Desert Turned to Glass. Um, and uh, it's a collection of work really that looked at uh, kind of a stacked idea of the origins, origins of life, the origins of consciousness, and the origins of art. I kind of wanted to look at those as they stacked over time um, and how they kind of interacted with each other. Um, and so it, it was, it's been several years kind of producing the research and talking to people and then shooting the film, um, but it was a commission for the 100th anniversary of the planetarium, mm -hmm. which I don't know if people know this, but this is the 100th year. It was invented in 1923. Um, in Yenna, Germany, actually was a, the first geodesic dome uh, was built on the roof of the Zeiss factory. Most people think Buckminster Fuller invented the geodesic dome, but actually in the 20s in Germany, of course it's the, the company that invented or could control the curved optics, the mathematics could build a curved building, which ended up being the planetarium. And so um, to make a work for the 100th anniversary, uh, I really started to dive into the typology of this architecture. And, um, and in doing that, I really wanted to look at, of course, this deep time, a piece of architecture, this, this dark dome where we really imagine the cosmos, imagine beginnings, imagine endings. And so it kind of brought me to these questions of the origin of life. Um, the project itself was a really unique opportunity because it also allowed me to create an ecosystem itself as an exhibition space. And that's where I was really excited because I wanted to take these abstract ideas, these scientific theories, these myths and legends and religious kind of beliefs and bring them into a very embodied experience, um, a way that you move through the architecture, mm -hmm. you move through space, so these ideas could be uh, relevant and um, experienced like in a way that the body could feel it in an affective way. Mm. So the, I was super lucky in the sense that, of course, I got the dome, which was that image, which had a, a film projected on the parabolic screen. And then underneath of that, uh, if we go to slide three, um, there is a 15,000 liter pool of oil 
and uh, bacteria uh, actually, uh, I can never pronounce it, but you guys probably know this, um, but that bacteria that from the Baltic that eats um, petroleum. Um, and so actually my, my mother-in-law, Dr. Sarah Arab, was helpful in helping me research that. Um, so thank you to you as well, um, she's here today. Um, and so underneath the dome, I was this cavernous space. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to kind of create this kind of cosmic view of the origin of life, um, and then look at kind of a chthonic, or this kind of deep biosphere. And this is where Barbara was, was mm -hmm. very helpful uh, in getting me to think through the ideas of the deep biosphere, both the hot and, of course, the cool biosphere. Um, and so together, they kind of created this spherical model of, of, of reality. Um, and so the, the top part was the story of panspermia. And so that's why I wanted to ask you about mm. this meteorite um, idea of the origin of life. So I wanted this idea of life being generated without kind of a cosmic aspect, without solar radiation, kind of deep in the earth possibility, mm -hmm. speculating about that, and looking at this idea of a meteorite coming to earth and seeding it with these amino acids or with these types of um, uh, chemistry that we just heard about uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, in between these two spaces, we go to slide two, um, puncturing these two was a installation of a floating mm -hmm. meteorite. Um, this is actually a, a famous Canadian meteorite, um, I should say a model because it's levitating. The original one is a sacred object, it's called the Manitou Stone. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the first meteorites ever being repatriated to a First Nations um, community. Um, and so, uh, of course, it was stolen and actually returned, to, it was in U of T and at the ROM until it was returned only a few years ago. Um, and they're building the interpretive site now on the location where it impacted the earth in Alberta. Quick question, yeah. what's the scale of that thing? The scale is 24 inches. Okay. Um, and so, uh, of course, ownership and property and who owns these things is important when it lands, right? The rights are, as we know, where a meteorite lands, whoever owns that piece of land owns that meteorite, and of course theft and all these things are history. So I wanted to take that moment and freeze it just before it hit the earth. So it's levitating there um, about an inch off the ground. Um, we use kind of a, a camera visual optic system and balance it with an electromagnetic field so it stays in place statically. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, exactly that. I wanted to look at a cosmological object, perhaps the first origin of life, um, that didn't include possession and ownership, right? And I wanted to look at this object, um, which is sacred to some people, and of course, an intense area of fascination for scientists, and the cosmological story is there and say this is a shared, shared conversation. And actually, I worked with the First Nation um, facility manager at the gallery, because um, this is a, a planetarium that's been repurposed into a Kunsthalle, kind of like Mocha here in the city. And, and he helped take care of this and help us build this. And it was really this moment where we both could actually uh, talk about the same object from completely two different narratives and how they could be important in our origin of life stories mm -hmm. and yet bring people together instead of what usually in this country through private property, through ownership, through theft and stolen and, and assimilation, it divides people. Um, so that was kind of the, the, that punctured through the building, through the stairwell, uh, kind of three stories, connecting the film, uh, which included the story of this meteorite coming to Earth, um, and then the subterranean afterwards. Um, the final, um, I wanted to ask you a question, and maybe I can do it right now. Um, I don't want to sound like the dumbest person in the room, so I was a little bit shy, but. Uh, all compete with uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, a lot of the research I've been doing is I've been on sabbatical in Japan as a researcher at the University of Tokyo is looking at artificial life. Mm -hmm. So this question, if we look backwards, of course, there's a lot of people that are trying to ask these questions moving forward also in a certain sense. Everything from artificial intelligence and artificial life to synthetic life and so on. And so um, I was wondering, what is the current definition of life? Yeah. Um, because we kind of talked about it all very simply today, but as an artist, you're always there to challenge these dogmatic positions mm -hmm. and like, okay, how do we define this? And going from a Western university to you know Tokyo and more of a Shinto Buddhist you know general comprehension of how life and consciousness is being quite different, mm -hmm. this question kind of started to bubble up. Mm -hmm. And so I was really curious how and what your field defines as life leading up to it, and when does that threshold yeah. get, is it, a, is it a singular threshold, or is it a gradient? I think most people now kind of think that it's a gradient. Mm. Um, there is not this magic moment when something that was living became, or non-living became living. Mm. At least that's sort of the consensus at the moment. Mm. Um, 
And interestingly, you know, when you brought up this idea about having gone to uh, Japan and the Eastern mindset there, mm -hmm. uh, and how that fits with the reductionist, materialist, physicalist approach that we have for mm -hmm. science. Uh, personally, I'm also very interested in Eastern philosophy, mm -hmm. in particular Advaita Vedanta and mm -hmm. Buddhism and many other Indian philosophies which talk about the unity of everything and consciousness is described as existence, isness. Anything that is, is, is. So they call that existence is consciousness, right? And so right, right at the top of your, uh, of the, uh, what you described, you started talking about how you're interested in how life got started, consciousness, and art. Sort of in a, mm -hmm. I, or at least I thought, mm -hmm. in a temporal sequence. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the sequence that we always use in our reductionist, materialist, physicalist approach. But when you come at it from a philosophical point of view, there's a completely uh, philosophical approach that has nothing to do with Eastern philosophy or Western philosophy. It's called analytical idealism. If you, if you examine um, logically uh, certain assumptions that we make in science, you find out that they are not uh, you, you hit against a contradiction. Um, and so the idea that consciousness emerges from life, which is what we all have to assume as scientists, is not necessarily logically consistent with this way of analytical thinking. And so there's a whole field of analytical philosophy. In the West, they call it analytical philosophy. In the East, they call it Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism. Um, that says consciousness predates matter, and that matter may or may not be real. Depends on what you mean by consciousness, what you mean by matter, and also it's always about the definitions, what you mean by life. You know, now some people are saying, well, information, life is a system that lives in dis disequilibrium and converts you know, chemical energy, whatever systems into information, then you ask the question, what is information, right? So. It's always about language and definitions, and this is where things get uh, in, you know, there's a word called ineffable, which is you, you get to a point where you can't describe things in language anymore. And so if any of you meditate, you'll sort of know what I'm talking about. Um, and so for me, there's a, there's a beauty in all of this that, you know, I try to explore the origins of life, but of course, then you push it all the way back to origins of the universe. And there's a point of mystery for me, uh, which I try not to, uh, the, the reductionist approach is to say someday we'll figure it out based on science. And my personal gut instinct is we may never figure it out and that's fine with me. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but the, sh the short answer is we don't necessarily have a moment when non-living became living. Uh, is sort of the consensus view on that topic. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, you've really echoed a lot of the things I've been trying to explore, yeah. exactly. And I, I wouldn't necessarily call them temporal, but stacked sometimes. Yeah, That's yeah. How they, nested, how yeah. they integrated and uh -huh. nested. And if we go to slide four, the last work actually was an artificial intelligence that uh -huh. was trained on my own voice, uh -huh. which read the famous lecture by Thomas Nagel, What It's Like to Be a Bat. Yes. Right, this idea yeah. of, of knowing another consciousness to a phenomenological position. Right but I trained it to only speak in ultrasonic frequencies. Huh. So this is actually not a microphone, this is a speaker that's uh -huh. used in bat research, uh -huh. which was installed in the kind of subterranean space of the gallery. Uh -huh. um, and so it was kind of this triad uh -huh. um, between, let's say, uh, a human sentient kind of creature uh -huh. that was uh, mediated through an, uh, uh, a burgeoning kind of AI, because we're not there yet, but mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of on the threshold of some of these questions. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, another species, another mammal, which normally is an other for us. Yeah. And so I was very interested in kind of connecting these questions, as you say, that they're not isolated and right. they're not just back in the history of time. Mm -hmm. You know, asking these questions as yeah. they as they coincide. They're more and more relevant today, yeah, as you mm -hmm. say with AI. Mm -hmm. You know, can AI be conscious? Is that even a con is that a, even a question to ask? Depends on how you define consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where you know what does it feel like to be a bat comes in. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's slightly kind of interesting experiments because I found the planetarium for me as an artist was yeah. an interesting experiment yeah. because um, part of the film, we filmed a lot of volcanoes in Japan. Again, we were looking at the Hadean mm -hmm. kind of uh, origins, so we were in Iceland and the Canary Islands, filming kind of this formation of an atmosphere and this kind of liquid water you were talking about in the film. 
And then eventually we ended up in the oldest desert in the world, the Namib mm -hmm. Desert mm -hmm. in Namibia. Mm -hmm. And so we really looked at the earth kind of geologically changing through time from fresh lava mm -hmm. through to mm -hmm. a sedimentary desert. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we ended in the oldest cave art in the world. Um, and we were filming these in these domes, and they were these kind of domed parabolic roofs. And so this mm. was very purposeful in the sense of the planetarium. So we kind of wanted almost to reconstruct. I mean, I mean um, you can yeah. throw back this thing that it's maybe not an experiment, but just like I think scientists are looking at recreating the yeah. chemistry, yeah. was looking at recreating that moment in the darkened yeah. space yeah. of these domed architecture, yeah. whether it's a Paleolithic cave or whether it's a planetarium, right. these moments of hallucinations in the dark, mm -hmm. where we start to kind of question mm -hmm. uh, our own subjectivity and start to see things maybe we haven't seen before yeah. through these experiences. Yes, I mean, this whole idea about the, the egg and cosmic mm, egg yeah. and the caves and mm. the, uh, uh, what is it, uh, in, in Greece, in classical, in classical Greece, they mm. had the, um, I'm forgetting the name now, but the, the women who would, the oracles, oh, oracle. right, go into mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. caves. So something about that dark space, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. brings some kind of deep-seated something to the, to the surface mm -hmm. that yeah. we normally kind of lose track of in our daily externally oriented world, right? So in that dark space, you turn off all your senses. There's no light, there's no sensation, there's no nothing. All you can do is focus inwards. And that brings something up that is profound. I, I will say recently I've discovered that some of the eternal fires around which the oracles mm. were built mm -hmm. are probably related to subsurface Methane water rock seeds. reaction, yeah. methane mm. and hydrogen and seeds. Hydrogen seeds. Yeah. So there may have been some chemistry yeah. aiding yeah. the, uh, <laughs> right. the uh, ability yeah. there. But certainly what this reflects is how, I don't know if there's any question more appropriate for multiple ways of investigation and communication mm -hmm. than the origin of life. Yeah. So Joel, mm -hmm. do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just loving these conversations. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Uh, again, you know, thank you so much uh, for, for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago that we were here and we were talking about science and aesthetics. Uh, and it was really nice. I got started a little bit on the notion of sound as well, which mm -hmm. I think Charles has a lot um, uh, in, his, in his work as well. And, and I, mm, I, I began, uh, I think, thinking about this panel as a way to talk about some of the aesthetic crossovers of arts and science. You know, I work uh, in biology a little bit. I have some work um, at the forestry department uh, right now with uh, Dr. Uh, Tetman, um, where we're looking at uh, atmospheric bacteria and how we can um, put uh, you know, uh, uh, poetry in it, uh, genetic poetry in it mm. that's ciphered so that we can create uh, poetic rain, <laughs> mm. for instance. I mean, it's just an experiment that we've been working on. Um, but, you know, it's also interesting that uh, over the pandemic, uh, I think, um, which, which really is the, the kind of paradigmatic shift that, that I think we have in my, in my system of belief around, mm. around what life can and, and should be as well, you know, the notion of, of culturing, uh, I think, and growing bacteria. And, you know, everyone has this experience where you just leave something in the fridge and then it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you walk away and you go back and you're like, oh, no, you know, I didn't know that there were uh, conditions that were favorable for things to grow. Uh, and so my question has really been um, about the artistic medium or the artistic practice as being a hospitable environment mm -hmm. um, for uh, creativity to thrive and uh, what does that mean in terms of accessibility? What does that mean in terms of creating a, a, a respectful community of practice that uh, values, uh, you know, all different kinds of influences? Uh, but also thinking about the way that each person comes in with a different cultural memory uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been very excited about this notion of memory that's been talked about uh, as a aesthetic crystallization of the past. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a kind of sense, um, that's where I think uh, I would be, I, I would love to start, <laughs> you know, my part of today's, today's talk, uh, or, or like panel or whatever it is <laughs> here. So if you could just pull up uh, that website, Joe, real quick. Um, this is a project uh, that uh, I did recently uh, called In Silence. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of backstories around it, but the notion, um, is the embedding of sound within something that is somewhat frozen uh, or ossified, and then these repeated uh, kind of uh, uh, ebbs and flows of revelation and concealment. Mm -hmm. um, 
So when I was in, uh, I did my PhD in Seattle uh, some moons ago, and uh, you know when I was there, uh, I uh, found out about the the undocumented migrant population uh, living a little bit south of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say living, but you know uh, uh, situated somewhat a little bit south of Seattle, uh, in an uh, in in an undocumented uh, migrant uh, uh, in incarceration um, in um, center uh, detention center. Uh, and <laughs> okay, that's that's really awkward now. Um, <laughs> could you move that up uh, a little bit? The website, not my face. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just so we can see the uh, just a little more. There we go. Okay, just leave mm, it there. Ah, okay. So, uh, so when I was there, um, I tried um, my hand at being a, a befriender because uh, I felt very strongly uh, as a migrant person as well uh, that uh, you know I was there without my family and I, and I very felt very much for uh, people who were in the same plight. Uh, and of course, you know, it was very, very different. Um, um, where we were, uh, they were incarcerated, I wasn't. Um, but uh, I volunteered as a befriender in that system. And I realized uh, at some point that I couldn't actually get to know somebody and it was a very physical disconnect mm. uh, that I had because they were behind these um, airproof or, um, you know, weatherproof uh, glasses and I couldn't feel um, the atmosphere of their, of their breathing. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's some thought about this commonality of air that we share, and when that's taken away from us, uh, you know, that's, that's something that is uh, very, very palpable, uh, but it's also something that uh, we don't necessarily talk a lot about, and that it's, that it's always invisible, that it's always hidden under, you know, currents of, of observation, you know, you, or, or everyday life, and you kind of lose, lose track of that. And and I was relating, I was sitting down and I was thinking about that in relation to this notion of frozen sound that Gother started talking about really, really early on as a poetic kind of um, representation of sound in the environment. You know, architecture is a form of frozen music, as he wrote. Uh, you know, and, and that's, that's something about the ratios that are within the, the windows and walls, you know, how, how far they are from each other. Uh, but he also talked about frozen sound in these catacombs that led to, the, to a central cathedral. You know, how you would go in and even though it was somewhat silent, you could feel that silence as a palpable potential of sound. Uh, you know, there's this really beautiful legend uh, that uh, had this, 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 this voyager who went to the edge of the world and when he got to uh, this icy tundra, uh, he realized he could hear in the distance like shouts and, and, and people fighting and he was like, what's going on here? And then they realized that uh, there was a battle that was fought there the last winter, and it was so cold mm -hmm. that the sound had frozen in the air. And because a year later, uh, you know, the, it was a little warmer, the sound started to thaw, and the thaw, and he could actually start to hear them. And so he asked the soldiers, grab a little bit of that frozen sound, let it thaw in your hand so you could hear what's going on. And, and that, those re alternations um, and, and revelations, I think it's, it's very aesthetically similar to a, a lot of these ebbs and flows cycle, you know, and I was thinking, of course, the water dry cycle, you know, but also these kinds of attraction and mm. repulsions mm -hmm. that happen within, within broader evolutionary time. Mm. Um, so just, just real quick, that, that project in silence in two minutes is, um, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, well, In Silence uh, was a project where I was embedding uh, these stories of narratives of my friends uh, in the Jane Finch region up at York. You know, we work very closely uh, with, uh, with the uh, communities around the Aukil campus, and that includes the Jane Finch region, and, and you guys might know it's one of the most racialized uh, and misunderstood neighborhoods. <coughs> uh, and during the pandemic, you know, a lot of uh, things were very much exacerbated. Uh, so this project uh, was, uh, you know, an accumulation of some of these stories that were um, uh, acted through actors with nonverbal expressions. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the installation itself, it was largely silent, uh, except for these murmurings that would be piped through this 16-foot pool uh, and uh, emerge as cymatic patterns uh, as they were uh, acting. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to leave it as that. You know, there's some, some level uh, where um, I, I think, uh, you know, how, how an installation or how an artistic piece or an art aesthetic experience uh, evolves over time 
that has <laughs> you know, structural similarities mm. to some of the, the ways that these minerals work, which mm. is why I'm so excited mm -hmm. about these like right. amb amphi amphiphilic, amphiphilic molecules, molecules yeah. that were moving yeah. in reaction to different pH um, uh -huh. and, and, uh, and protocells as uh -huh. well in general. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have to run pretty soon, but really quickly, I want to say a couple of things before I run is, uh, you know, the idea about the breath and sound and air and sharing the common air that we, uh, that we, that we have and this wall separating people from each other. Um, of course, one of the things, one of the ways that we define something as living or not is whether it's breathing, right? Even a bacterium essentially has to breathe in a sense. And uh, so this concept of air and, and breath is very, very fundamental to uh, how one, one might think of as an essential feature of life. And um, sound, of course, is related to air. You can't, or some medium, right? You can't have sound travel without a medium. And um, again, coming back to this, you know, the, the dark, darkness where you turn off your senses, turn off the sound, turn off the light, turn off the vision, whatever it is. Again, that um, when, you, when you kind of sit in, in silence, there is this sort of uh, hum that you have in the background, right? Just the background noise. Um, so to me, all of those are, are, are profound things that I, I kind of hold or carry around with myself. Um, and that's pretty much all I want to make connection. That's all I can think of to connect to here, uh, personally, because I, I have to run, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation, and the, and the art you guys have put up is absolutely beautiful, very moving. So thank you all very thank much. You so much. Yeah. Please, please thank you. And we ho I hope we can connect yeah, we'll later. Connect yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I mean, I love, the, I love this, the Rabelais story of the frozen battle, right? Is yeah. that Rabelais? Yes, the Rabelais. yes, Rabelais. That's right. Oh, yes. my goodness. And so, you know, it's just the first history of sound recording yeah. and, and then ice is really interesting. There's a, um, when I was f researching about you before the talk and I was looking at the story, I was really excited because the next version of the project I'm doing now is much more Canadian focused and it's much more ice focused. Mm -hmm. um, part of the book that Barbara was kind enough to participate in as an interview, also I had an interview with Kim Tate yeah. and her research on ICE-7, um, which was discovered here at the ROM um, in one of their uh, diamonds. And looking at ICE as a mineral structure itself is, is something that um, I've been looking at and of course what uh, Nita uh, um, was talking about in her lecture and this, these frozen meteorites. Of mm -hmm. course we have the Tegus like meteorite here in Toronto at the ROM. Um, as one of these recovered frozen meteorites, kind of the, the only one I think that I'm aware of that's been recovered frozen in the world until, of course, last month, the, mm -hmm. the return mission from mm -hmm. Bannu. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there's, this, there's something there, I think, about the frozenness and, and chasing, of course, life through water um, mm -hmm. and looking at that, and, and, and uh, which really connects, I was thinking of your work while, while I was looking at that, how exciting that is to continue these conversations. Um, and the origin of life through these kind of, I think through a Canadian landscape, through, through these questions of frozenness, um, which isn't just uh, uh, in the lab, but also like mm -hmm. in the landscape mm -hmm. itself. Well, interesting that you asked about the origin of life, or sort of definition of life, mm -hmm. um, because I, I do a lot of work with um, uh, s space exploration in the context of mm -hmm trying to understand how we would definitively mm. go about mm. understanding whether something's alive or mm. not mm. on other planets. And one of the key things we continue to emphasize is that we don't have answers for that on this planet. So mm. literally, some of the reports I've had the pleasure to work with a ton of other colleagues on have said we're, we're not even going to try to define mm. life. But what we will say strongly is that you, I'll, I'll, I'll use the actual wording, it says a biosignature, meaning a sign mm. of life, mm. is only powerful if it can be defined in the context of probability, in the sense that it must be thought of to be produced by life, but also have shown to have a high probability of not being able to be mm. produced 
by abiotic mm. processes. So we used to define life just by life. We used to define life by anything we could think of that was living. And we've suddenly realized that we're missing the whole half of the equation, mm -hmm. that we can only define life in the context of its baseline. Mm -hmm. And understanding whether or not there are other processes that we haven't looked at yet or haven't thought about yet that can do something that mimics what we thought only life could do. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of interesting because it's the about the deepest I know of philosophy getting into space science exploration. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, it's very profound at this point, and, and, and it l therefore opens up this whole idea of investigating minerals and investigating sound and mm -hmm. investigating water, because it's an understanding that you can't r actually remove your definition of life from the context in which it's found. Mm -hmm. So I, I hadn't thought about it in terms of artistic uh -huh. well, aspects yeah, until I you both started speaking. I mean, we, we were talking about the deep biosphere, you know, and the hot of the cool, you know, the, the shadow biosphere. Yeah was really something that came up yeah. in our conversation. Yeah. And exactly that, the conversation today is RNA, DNA, but of course, what if we're looking for life and an origin of life or an, another definition of life that's not you know, RNA-based? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Is that? So I think these are other questions in that black box uh, as kind of referred to in the first lecture, mm -hmm. which is kind of wide open and we don't know how deep that, that black box is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to hear about some of the work you're doing around the Anthropocene because these issues actually mm. come back again. Like, you know, yeah. here we are talking about the origins of life, and mm. to some extent, there are people who talk about where we're at now mm -hmm. in almost apocalyptic terms. You mm -hmm. know, I don't personally think we're coming to the end of days, but uh, it's interesting to have that juxtaposition. So I, I'd love to hear more about the work that you're doing. Yeah, and you know. It, I mean, I'm thinking about different scales of observation as well, you know, and, and a lot of the work that I tend to do now um, is very, it's very human centric. So, you know, we work with, with communities, we work with people, and I'm, I'm, I've taken on a new role at York as well that's focusing primarily on com community engaged research in the arts. Uh, you know, how things like community music and how things like uh, simple advocacies being there um, for people uh, kind of really changes uh, the way uh, institutions of higher learning uh, can be, uh, you know, hospitable environments again, you know, for for people, uh, and and it's kind of in reaction to the to the notion that, you know, if the end of the world is indeed coming, then maybe we should really just band together and and uh, <laughs> and, and be stronger together, um, but but it's also been interesting thinking about the ways that. Uh, you know, like I mentioned er slightly earlier that uh, I have an ongoing project that's interested in, in the atmospheric microbiome. Uh, and partly the reason for it is, is that, you know, the, the air is something that is invisible um, to, to most people and to most conversations at a particular scale, of course. Uh, we, we know, you know, I mean, any scientist or biologist knows there's a lot of stuff that is teeming in the atmosphere itself, and clouds are actually these really vast ecosystems. Uh, they're very dynamic and they shift a lot. Uh, and creation of clouds also is not something that's a purely kind of you know wind-driven process. It's also got a lot to do with the, the kinds of aerosols that are, are embedded within them. Uh, and so I, I'm really interested in, in seeing um, what are potential speculative futures uh, that uh, that we come up with, uh, and you know, climate geoengineering is of course one of them, um, which is which is something that is almost teetering on the brink of, of be becoming a reality uh, right now, and, and it's uh, it's it's one of those conversations, uh, you know, so-called quote unquote at the at the end of the world where we need a plan B, and then um, we're kind of jumping into it without uh, realizing what the effects of those are. Um, so one of the things uh, I've been interested in looking at also is the aesthetic differences, the aesthetic um, uh, 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 changes, uh, I guess, in the atmosphere um, with uh, uh, in result of climate geoengineering. Um, so uh, earlier this year uh, at Design TO, I, I proposed a, a small project where we were speculating on the types of clouds that would that would emerge, uh, you know, based on climate geoengineering, and we, we did, it was called Cloud Atlas uh, Part B or something, because, uh, you know, nobody's really changed the nomenclature for clouds for like 200 years now. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting to think now, if they're all anth anthropogenic, what would they look like? So, you know, there were these pictures of, of like teddy bears, because, you know, they started selling these uh, processes to, to rich people who wanted like a cloud name after their, 
16 year old or whatever it was, uh, you know, there's a whole economy over there uh, that was that was that that I wrote about, uh, and then there were also clouds that kind of just were um, new um, biofilms that were uh, pulling on these different bacteria with with very specific morphologies that could help to sequester clouds so that they could um, reflect light a little bit more, uh, and these were all speculative. Of course, but they were kind of based on uh, some of the science that was coming out um, of, the, of these uh, these research institutes. Mm, fascinating. I mean, I think art is. I'm really interested in this because actually, this morning my partner is also here. We have a short grant on shaping atmosphere and mm -hmm. looking at solar geo. We, we literally just put the edits on an article that's coming out to next month on solar geoengineering and, mm -hmm. and arts and architecture. Cool. And so, looking at projects and artists who ask these questions, whether it's writers like Kim Stanley Robinson and the Ministry of the Future, mm -hmm. or whether it's artists like yourself that are looking at these things, because of course the Scopex, the Harvard Scopex experiments, yep. they're, they're controversial, and there's private corporations that are already going ahead with geosolar engineering, and not knowing the full ramifications, and from a scientific aspect, of course, but culturally as well, and, mm -hmm. and how to work through these on a hard science, but mm -hmm. also in a speculative way, um, because these things are full scale, they can't be done in the lab, the Earth is the lab at this point, and so, I think this is this is one conversation that we can have mm -hmm. between artists and scientists to try to actually flesh out the dangers um, and the, the politics uh, mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. That seems a really good moment to open up the conversation to everybody here, because I'm sure there are going to be a number of people who would like to uh, either ask comments, uh, ask questions, or, or have comments of their own. So I'll start with this issue and yeah, okay, all right. When you're done, pass it over, and I'll let you guys move the microphone amongst you, so I'm not jumping up and down. Hi, um, thanks so much for the illuminating um, perspectives. What I was curious about, um, and what seemed to, in some ways, unite both of the things you were talking about, um, was that both with the, um, the, the cloud teddy bears for sale um, and with um, the thing you were talking about, this is vision that seems to be sort of dystopian. And in particular, it seems to be um, a continuation of processes that are going on right now. Um, and you're talking about speculation about futures. I'm curious if you speculate about futures in which we actually um, change things, or if it's purely speculation about futures in which um, we put a new coat of paint on things we already do, like selling ads in the sky, um, and they appear more gratuitous and, and um, unfortunate, but are fundamentally continuations of identical processes we have now, as opposed to, OK, we actually decide we got to do something big, and we do something big, and things really change in a meaningful way. Does that make sense? I mean, hmm. what's, what's the famous quote? It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. <laughs> um, this, is the, this is the question. It's a big question um, to ask. I mean, uh, I mean, in a way, that's why we wanted to work on this current project of the origin of life. It's kind of, for me at least, um, because of a lot of the end of the world conversations, which are so important and they're happening, um, um, to look at kind of an origin story in a way as we look at trying to solve something again. Um, I don't know, I think there were some echoes there in, in a way to look at it largely, but um, I mean the geosolar engineering that that uh, Joel brought up is a really good one. Mm -hmm. um, depends on what side of the fence you're on, whether that is doing something real and, and trying to make an effect and actually do something from some people's dystopia and other people, it's mm -hmm. a it's a solution. So I think that's that's a, a good question. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you have an answer I, to that one. I, I do actually, and I and I want to say that that these projects are are what they are um, because I think they say a certain thing. But I want to say that the optimism in the the end of end of life or or, or, the, or or the end of the world kind of kind of idea is is what we're living now, and I do feel very strongly that the the works that I am embedded within right now, or the or the work that I that I do, uh, is um, you know the the best thing uh, that we can do at this at this uh, at, at at the end of the world. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples. I think um, there's there's so much strength and resilience that comes out of of this, you know. And and we talk about creativity, and we talk about perhaps you know creative evolution as you know this this idea of a cell or a body that is open. Uh, to external influences, you know, and then they kind of react accordingly, uh, and they, you know, are kind of massaged into a, a form of, you know, evolutionary trend, right? Um, and 
you know, thinking about that as a metaphor for the way that we deal with the situations around the world today, you know, it's, it's really uh, something very interesting to, to value the resilience that uh, communities, uh, especially communities that have, uh, you know, trauma-informed uh, communities that have a, lo a lot of um, uh, bad stuff happen to them, uh, to, to build on that resilience, uh, it, it really helps um, kind of uh, give you a little bit of strength uh, as well to, to move forward. There's a, a book by um, William Caskell, is his name, he's a philosopher at Oxford, young guy, um, called uh, What We Owe the Future. And I thought it was a fascinating perspective because uh, he's very committed to, uh, as a philosopher, he's committed to developing a philosophy for living in better sync with the planet. And, and so there's a lot of interesting things in the book and he'll have to forgive me if I get this main part wrong. But what really struck me was the following. He had um, been looking at a uh, history of the Earth and we all know like our, our life, we, we're a shred of a fingernail on the history of the Earth, neither to the beautiful time scale there, but to, to understand that the Earth is more than 4.2 billion years old and modern humans just come in right at the end. And he also took a look at extinction cycles, so, you know, how long do most species last on the planet? And it turns out if you take a look at the history of the Earth, most species arise and then go extinct on something about a million year time scale. Mm -hmm. So that would mean, and this is how he put it, often when we're thinking about the problems right now that we've created on this planet and we should be and need to be, we somehow fall into this idea of thinking about we're, t we're trying to save what's left for the last stragglers of what has been the human experiment. And he turns that around and he said, if you think about the fact that most species last for a million years, despite what the planet has thrown at them, then in fact, what we have to do is reimagine the future for the vast majority of humanity that's still to come. And I just thought it was a very powerful way to deal with the issues, but, but put it in that kind of context. And so anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating book. It's, uh, like it's, it's, it was heavy going for me because I'm not a philosopher, but it was a very, very interesting one because he so beautifully embedded, I think, an understanding of time scale and, and uh, processes mm. and things. I, I enjoyed that one. And I, I think it, it speaks to the, the question that you so rightly raised there. You know, uh, the sense of optimism and pessimism also d really depends on how anthropocentric you are as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you, were, as you were pointing out with the Anthropocene or something, I mean, <coughs> oh, yeah. I mean exactly that, the humans, the, the, the world will go on. Of course, so it's going to be it, fine. It, it's you're it's you're pessimistic if you're really worried <laughs> about, yes, of course, uh, the human species, yeah. which, of course, we should care about our neighbors in proximity, but you can still, ha you don't have to be pessimistic in a certain sense of realizing. It's kind of like your own existential, yeah. uh, you know, being towards death. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not here to live eternally. Yeah, although so we're all rather fond of the human race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had a question uh, going back to the definition of life for a moment. Because uh, if we throw out any hope of doing a scientific definition for a moment, one which I, I don't know, I'm a little partial to from philosophy has always been this idea that life is actually about value creation. So mm -hmm. things that are living, they're doing something where they're making value, whereas things that are kind of going through abiotic processes, uh, they're, they're not, they're just kind of not leaving that impact. Now, of course, here value does not mean economic value or otherwise we really are dystopian <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but uh, one kind of intriguing thing, and this is why I love the fact that we've done kind of an aesthetics focused panel here, is because that is exactly what artists do. And the moment anyone makes art, you are doing value creation. So I was curious if you ever looked at your work on life, because you both have worked so much on it, and seeing a parallel between what you do as an artist, what a living being does, d has it given you any hope of a com kind of, let's say, non-scientific definition of life? Oh, don't look at me. That's bold. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, there are people who have talked about life uh, as a poetics of liveliness, uh, you know, in terms of what we're talking about, biosignatures and what what life affords uh, in terms of uh, reacting or, or um, adding to the environment. 
when, when Nita was look, uh, talking about the Strombolites, uh, it was interesting because my grad school was in, in Perth, Western Australia. I did a really weird um, <laughs> master's degree in biological arts at an institute that doesn't exist anymore uh, for, <laughs> uh, for, for many reasons. I can talk about that later. But, um, but we, we I was really interested in going out to listen to the Trombolites uh, and to see if there were stories that you know you could glean um, after these billions of years of in existence, these cyanobacteria formations. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if, if you remember, there were these like potatoes and soup that were <laughs> that were really really cute. Uh, but it was it was interesting because I went out there and I had such reverence for these these things and um, the way we uh, approached them was really with reverence and with awe. Uh, and we were actually on somebody's uh, private farm, and so at some point uh, they let out the dogs on us, because uh, you know, and there was like a lot of shouting, a lot of dogs yelping around, and then the dogs jumped into the water and smashed a couple of sombolites, mm. and you know, almost at that instant we we had this profound, <laughs> profound uh, sense of loss, right? And um, and I think that it's. It's so important, uh, you know, to have such a mix of this this aesthetic um, version of, of 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 what it is, you know, and and that aesthetic um, uh, uh, um, experience of, of wonder really is is a very inf it, it has to be an informed one. I mean, there are potatoes and soup, and they're cute, you know, but then it's like a, a very kind of hy hybrid, you know, understanding of what of what life is that that merges the aesthetics. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I understand the question exactly, but um, I, I will say that that this project um, that I talked about was rather special for me because it was self-reflective in the sense of what artists do and what role artists have played. A lot of my previous research on military architecture, um, uh, military colonialization, and so forth. So, to to really ask what the foundations of art was and what its role was was something interesting. And one of the other contributors to, to the book um, is the archaeologist David Lewis Williams, who wrote the book called The Mind in the Cave. Oh. And his thesis really is that it's through the shamanistic rituals in the deep dark cave that our consciousness was actually born as homo sapiens. Um, and now that can be kind of, uh, in the last, I guess, two or three years, that can be kind of uh, folded back a little bit more. But this idea that actually the creation of the first Paleolithic art were traces of hallucinations within these rituals. And actually, it was this kind of doubling. Um, uh, and that hallucination is in general from either sensory deprivation, all these things that Nito's talking about, sensory deprivation, mm -hmm. either a chemical ingestion of some poison, purposely or non-purposely. Uh, a lot of the spaces were actually, and you'll love this, were at the most resonant places in caves, mm -hmm. actually, that it was sound that was first before the images. And they found this because of obviously musical instruments, but because these properties in, in the film that um, Alu Roshan and I shot in Namibia, we, we purposely found this one cave that had a parabolics where it created a resonant um, frequency standing wave. Wow. And so it was through these ritualistic experiences, through sound and drumming and through these things that the doubling of seeing something appeared in the darkness that then people would start to trace out or participate with their handprints. And so for me, being an artist is really participating in that story. And that's why for the 100th anniversary of the Planetarium was to recreate that experience for the visitor, mm -hmm. to sit down in a dark space and go through this hallucinogenic film where by the end of it, hopefully a half an hour of this kind of trance-like state, you end up looking at this original cave art in the dark and you start to realize that, okay, the art is not just a representation. It's not just some scratches that it's a participatory aspect of life itself and our consciousness ourselves. So I think in that way, one hopes to participate in that narrative mm -hmm. um, today with what we're doing, hopefully. Mm -hmm. and, and touch, if mm. I might. I mm. mean, the, 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 the secret that earth scientists and geologists don't mm. ever talk about, right. but you've probably seen it, right? Mm. And it isn't about a beautiful mineral. Of course, you put something really pretty in front mm. of them, they get excited. It's not that. Mm. I have seen the most hard-boiled scientists in a room with Kim Tate, mm -hmm. looking at meteorites, and she'll say, this is the Murchison. It's like a little kid it's with a teddy bear. Literally, they got yeah. a touch, yeah. they've got a And what are they responding to? Because it, it's, it's, not, it's not a pretty thing. It's black, mm -hmm. it's small, it's black, it's a little lump. It doesn't look like anything. They're responding to what that represents for human knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
and they're all like that. Mm -hmm. You know, give a give a geoscientist the chance to touch a rock, and yeah. they're, you know, they're <laughs> interacting with it in this really tactile way. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ursula Franklin used to speak about this all the time. She used to say that um, we need to to we need to listen to our samples. Mm -hmm. She's a, a, a material scientist, right. right? I mean, this woman ran fancy equipment. She wasn't a mystic. <laughs> but she had this really profound and I think very insightful s saying that you have to listen to what the samples are saying to you. What's mm -hmm. the work of the hand? What is it that you are interacting with? Mm -hmm. So she actually saw dealing with material samples as a communication mm -hmm. in, in a scientific way, right, right. which I find fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing story to hear because as artists, you, that's like your default go-to, right? Um, the, the hand of the artist is just mm -hmm. like so cliche. Mm -hmm. So to hear, you know, scientists like participating in this, this ritual or practice mm -hmm. themselves is mm -hmm. pretty amazing. I'll find that article yeah. for some I would love to hear it, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Or Comments? Reflections? Please, yes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rumi or not. He says actually, yes. he, he has a verse, he says, ما سمیعی ما بسیعی ما خوشیم با شما نامحرمان ما خاموشیم We can hear from the things perspective of depth, everything we can see, we can hear, we can understand. If you can't communicate with us, it's because you haven't been one yet. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's beautiful. I've heard some of his, not that one, that's <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in your last sentences, I remember that uh, one of the Ursula's sentences in to the May Hall Center is that I planned like a huge, big painting of my experimental lab inside it to do the great experimental vision. So probably uh, in the huge gap of the year, even a civil engineer can't understand the architecture engineer so good, but probably in the end, we have kind of art for itself in any different vision of the engineering science. Because of this, we have a department of art science. So mm -hmm. probably any of us have kind of art inside mm -hmm. ourselves, and there is no gap between us. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, because another Persian said something's about Rumi. I remember something's about Rumi too. He said <laughs> somewhere, uh, which is uh, um, the translation with this something's like that. The sound can't make us to make a art, even we are not a singer, but probably even uh, hearing the holy sound of the baddest voice <laughs> into the fu uh, human nature can be a great opportunity to understand what's the vision of the great sound is for us. So thank you oh. so much for providing this opportunity for us. Thank you so much oh, for all of us. Thank you all. Those two quotes are such a beautiful place to wrap this. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much to both of you for that and to all of you for coming and joining us here today, particularly to Joel and Charles and Nita and to Haley as well, who I know will be really sad to have missed mm. being here, but we'll get her back another time. And um, please do, as we finish this formal aspect of the proceedings, remember we have a little reception uh, taking place next door, so please do come over and join us, um, and uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.